video lesson, we look at primary and secondary cells and batteries, charging and discharging. The simulation shows a zinc-copper wet cell. You can see zinc at the anode and copper at the positive cathode. The anode's negative here. And we're seeing the electron flow, but we could very well consider the conventional current flow flowing in the opposite direction. In this case, the light bulb is receiving the energy from the charge carriers but cells don't last forever. After some time, in this case, the zinc is depleted from the anode and we're getting copper deposited on the cathode. So this cell is just about dead right now and uh, the current would decrease and there'd be less energy to pass on to the light bulb. Light bulb would dim. Uh, our cell in this position is essentially dead. Closer look at the cell again, the copper is the cathode, the positive terminal, and the zinc is a negative terminal, the anode, and the electrons are flowing from left to right through the light bulb here. And we can think of positive current or conventional current shown by the blue arrow flowing from right to left. Again, it's an, an electric field that sets up uh, in this circuit and it's caused by a charge separation. And that comes from the different desires for copper and zinc for electrons. Copper wants the electrons and zinc doesn't. This zinc-copper arrangement will give a characteristic potential difference that we can measure using a volt voltmeter. And this cell is called a zinc-copper wet cell, also called a Daniel cell. When zinc gives up electrons at the anode, uh, zinc plus two ions dissolve into the aqueous solution. The aqueous solution also contains sulfate ions, SO4 negative two, and they flow from right to left through the solution. Also copper Cu plus two ions in the solution. Where the cathode and the solution meet, Cu plus two ions gain electrons and become copper solid and copper deposits on the cathode. So we have uh, zinc solid depleted at the anode and copper solid depositing on the cathode. The electrical energy that we see in the light bulb comes from the stored chemical potential energy of this reaction between copper and zinc. The materials used will determine the EMF of the cell. This Daniel cell will produce an EMF of about one volt using zinc and copper. Another characteristic of a cell is the cell's capacity. And capacity measures the amount of charge flowing through uh, the cell before it goes dead. You can see capacity can be measured in amp hours. That's current times time, and current times time is charge. So the capacity of a cell depends upon how much chemicals you have in the cell. Our cell is discharging here, and eventually we're gonna run out of zinc at the anode. I can return this cell to its original useful state if I can get the electrons to flow in the reverse direction. And as I do this, you can see that zinc is being redeposited on the anode and uh, copper is being depleted from the cathode. So sulfate ions are traveling in the opposite direction in the aqueous solution, but here I am recharging the battery by driving the electrons in the other direction. Cells that can be recharged like this are called secondary cells. Of course, we don't use hamsters to do this. We use uh, devices that can generate current like another cell or a battery or a generator. Conventional current flowing in the opposite direction means flowing clockwise in this case. So I have to hook up my charging supply like this. Notice the positive terminal of my battery in this case is hooked up to the uh, positive terminal of my Daniel battery or Daniel cell. If I include an ammeter here, I can keep track of my charging process. In the beginning, the ammeter reading will be high, in, uh, indicating that uh, the rate of charging is high, but it'll decrease over time as I charge the Daniel cell. As I continue to charge the Daniel cell, that charge separation is going to increase that copper cathode has become more and more positive and it'll make it more difficult for the current to flow down through the Daniel cell. So I need a direction for the current to travel as that cell becomes charged. I've added a resistor and a diode here. 
make it a light emitting diode and I now can tell when my Daniel cell is, is fully charged. When that light goes on, I've completed charging. My charging supply will force conventional current through the Daniel cell. Uh, and as it does that, copper plus two ions will go into solution and that will remove copper from the cathode. Sulfate ions will flow from left to right and my conventional current will continue flowing clockwise. Zinc plus two ions in solution will combine with electrons at the anode where the solution and the anode meet, uh, increasing the zinc on the anode. Connecting a voltmeter across the terminals of the Daniel cell, it's uh, very quickly going to show you, well immediately it's going to show you uh, a high potential difference. Um, not a good way to, to monitor the progress of the charging, it's the current that's traveling here, uh, your ammeter reading that will measure, uh, best measure the progress of your charging. A low ammeter reading means you're fully charged. As the Daniel cell becomes fully charged, you'll then have current diverting through the resistor in the LED. LED will light up another indicator that your battery is charged. Uh, there is some potential danger of overcharging a battery that will cause damage to the battery. So we looked at a Daniel cell, a cell that could be recharged. Uh, we're going to look at primary cells and their characteristics. These are cells that cannot be recharged. Uh, typically they're cheaper than secondary cells. They're DC devices, which means that current flows in one direction through them. And when they're assembled with their chemicals, they're ready to go off the shelf. You only get one discharge from them. And once they're fully discharged, you have to dispose of them properly. They typically have a higher energy density than secondary cells. And energy density is a measure of the amount of stored chemical potential energy in the battery. Uh, per unit volume. Lower sustained discharge currents are also typical with primary cells, lower than secondary. And a look at characteristics of secondary cells. Uh, when you purchase a secondary cell, it doesn't come ready to use. You have to give it its first charge first. Of course, secondary cells can be recharged, so it can be used many times. And if they're properly cared for, that could be hundreds or thousands of uh, reuse, reuses. Secondary cells are capable of high current discharges. An example is a car battery, which can produce uh, upwards of 100 amps. They're more expensive initially than primary cells, but uh, over the long run, they're more cost effective through recharging. Of course, there are also direct current devices, uh, meaning the current flows in one direction only. Of course, when you recharge, you, you put the current through in the opposite direction using a, another source. Common to both primary and secondary cells is how the battery or the cell discharges over time. So you might have a discharge curve that looks like this, where we've got time plotted on the horizontal, and battery potential difference or EMF plotted on the vertical. So this is showing a 9.6 volt uh, nickel metal hydride battery. For this kind of battery, each cell is 1.2 volts. So that means we have eight cells to make the battery. Think of it as eight different sites in the battery where a material receives electrons and eight different sites within the battery where a material gives up electrons. The potential difference of this battery really drops off right about here uh, where my potential difference is 0.9 volts. At this point we say the battery is dead and, and you won't get enough current from this battery to drive any devices. The halfway point, the half-life, is used to read off the operating potential difference uh, of the battery, in this case 9.6 volts at half-life. You do get uh, a greater potential difference initially for a very short period of time, uh, but it's that half point that we use. And the battery manufacturer will quote the 9.6 volts on this battery. 
though secondary cells and batteries can be recharged, they don't last forever. And this graph shows the life of a, a typical secondary battery. We plot capacity on the vertical. Uh, in this case, we, we've plotted uh, percent capacity, so 100% would be a fully charged battery. And number of cycles on the horizontal. So 1500 would mean we've recharged the battery 1500 times. Again, I could have plotted uh, amp hours on the vertical. As a rule of thumb, when you hit about 80% capacity after recharging, so here around 3600, 3500, the 35th hundred time we've recharged this, I'm only getting 80% of my original capacity. Uh, this secondary battery has reached the end of its life and recharging will not help. Let's review the main points of this video lesson. First, we compared the characteristics of primary and secondary cells. Secondly, we looked at the quantitative characteristics like capacity of a battery, which tells you uh, how long a battery can supply a sustained current. So uh, 1400 milliamp hours, which means the battery can supply 1400 milliamps for an hour. And energy density, which is a measure of how much chemical stored potential energy in joules is in the battery per volume of battery. We looked at the discharge curves for both primary and secondary cells, uh, where you plot capacity on the vertical and time on the horizontal, and the point at which your, your capacity really drops off uh, would indicate the life of the cell, where you, either you have to recharge again or you throw away your primary cell. And that half-life point is really the sustained potential difference. That's the potential difference that's uh, quoted on the battery. And that's what you'll see for the majority of the life of the primary cell or the potential difference during charging period. For a secondary cell, the charging curve might look something like this. I could plot potential difference on the vertical or capacity and time. And um, I use an LED and an ammeter to help us determine when to stop charging. You can overcharge a secondary cell and cause damage. We also looked at what a charging circuit looks like. So here's my dead battery, fully discharged 12 volt battery. I need to hook up my power supply like this to drive current in the opposite direction through that dead battery. Placing a resistor and a diode here, a light emitting diode, will one tell me when my battery is charged, the, the light on the diode will, will light. And secondly, it's kind of like a release valve for the pressure, if you will, as the uh, battery becomes charged, uh, that current needs somewhere to go. It will go through the resistor. And adding an ammeter here will also help me keep track of the charging process. Uh, I'll see a higher current at the beginning and a current approaching zero as the battery is fully charged. And secondary cells don't last forever. There is wear and tear as you charge cycle after cycle. If we plot capacity or percent capacity as a function of number of charging cycles, we'll see a curve that typically looks something like this. My capacity decreases over number of cycles and uh, when I'm at about 80% of my original charging capacity when the secondary cell was new. Uh, that's about the life of that secondary cell. All right, let's try a practice problem here. Here we have a graph and the question is which one of the following gives the operating potential difference and life of the battery between recharges? So it's a secondary cell here. A, B, C, D, pause your viewer and try this question. We can see that the potential difference really trails off at around 650 minutes. And at the half-life, so half of that, uh, we're at around 5, 5.1 volts. So our answer is B. Here's our second problem. A cell has a capacity of about 2400 milliamp hours. It's used to power a 1.2 amp electric helicopter motor. Which one of the following gives the best estimate for the flight time of the helicopter? Four answers here. Pause your viewer. Try this question. 
That's 2.4 amp hours. If we divide that by 1.2 amps, that gives us two hours, two hours that we'll be able to supply 1.2 amps. Our answer is B. Remember, the 2400 milliamp hours is a measure of how much charge flows before we have to recharge.